Hello and welcome to Thursdays on the Stoop. Today we have object lessons with Anne DeForest. Um, a little bit about Anne, um, her writing, as well as her practice as a walking artist centers on the resonance of place. Her short stories, essays, and poetry have appeared in Gyroscope Review, Cleaver Magazine, Unbroken, The Journal, and many, many more. Anne has documented stories of displacement, um, examined the bonds that develop between home healthcare providers and their patients in the book Healing on the Home Front, and has walked the entire perimeter of Philadelphia with three other artists, initiating an ongoing collaboration to open up new conversations about margins and edges, the power of slow creative practice, and art as a collective. So we're very excited to have Anne with us today for Object Lessons, and I will hand it over to you. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to see so many people here. I'm excited. Um, to talk about stuff and um, objects and the objects of our lives. And I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully um, I can handle both the Zoom screen and the shared screen at the same time, but bear with me. So um, can you see my screen? What are you seeing? Cause that just did something weird. Can you see my screen? And just does it say object lessons? I'm just seeing you right now, Anne. What? We're just seeing you. Okay, something happened. Now I don't know, excuse me. Hmm. Okay, hang on. I, I pressed um, share screen and it's funny, I can see something that gives me different views of my screen, but I can't. I can't see. Now do you see my screen? No. You're all good. Good? Okay. Great. Okay. So welcome. And so we are we just have so much stuff. And I'm very interested in the idea of inanimate objects that we live that are around us. I had a long time ago, um, I often just ponder how did this thing come into my life and what does it mean? <laughs> what is it? Um, I remember this a long time ago, this kind of dates me when my daughter was little, um, we had this pencil that showed up in our house and on it said, Socks, the first cat. Now, if you remember, Socks was um, the Clinton family's cat and I have no idea how that pencil got into our house. So I just am always curious about these things that, seem to have a life of their own. They have um, a past that I don't really know about. They enter our lives, we use them, they exit our lives, and we don't always know about their future, or we often know something about their future because their future might also end up being ending up in a landfill. But I wanted to explore what this everyday stuff um, is, and really as an exercise in close attention a chance to really pay attention to things that we take for granted and don't really think about and give those objects a chance to tell us their story. So in the chat, and I hope I can see that, um, put in as we're, as I'm reading through the introduction, put in three to five things that are just currently in your line of sight. Um, I took a few pictures of stuff that's on my desk. I have a somewhat cluttered desk. Maybe some of you have very neat desks, but look around your space and I'm sure you will find some object um, that is, it could be, it should be as um, ordinary as possible. Um, I think for the exercise today, it's better not to write about things or not to have the choose things that have deep sentimental value or that you know a lot they have or deep memories associated with them. This is really about stuff that you barely think about. Um, write about, write three to five things in there. And I wish there was a way that I could see the chat. I'm going to start with this quote that if any of you were at my um, wor workshop that I did in January with Nathaniel Popkin on the language of place, um, some of these investigations into objects are coming from a similar um, impetus. And this is a quote that has really been a touchstone for me. Um, for most of my writing life. Um, it's by Italo Calvino in a wonderful book called Six Memos for the Next Millennium. It's the final essay and it's from the final sentence um, in an essay called Multiplicity. Think what it would be to have a work conceived from outside the self 
to give speech to that which has no language, to the bird perching on the edge of the gutter, to the tree in fall, to so stone, to cement, to plastic. And then um, some of you may know that um, the poet Pablo Neruda did um, a book of odes. I think there are 24 odes to common things. And I have a, um, this is just the beginning of one of the poems that is a, um, that is an ode to things. And if I can get, I'm just having a hard time knowing how to look at, look and read my slides at the same time. So um, if somebody wants to volunteer to read, I can't see you at the moment, but um, I'll let someone just come on and as I figure that out. Do you want me to read what's in the chat? No, read the uh, ode to things. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Ode to things. I have a crazy, crazy love of things. I like pliers and scissors. I love cups, rings and bowls, not to speak, of course, of hats. I love all things, not just the grandest, also, the infinitely small thimbles, spurs, plates, and flower vases. Oh yes, the planet is sublime. It's full of pipes weaving handheld through tobacco smoke and keys and salt shakers, everything. So that's the, um, that's the beginning of a long poem. And at the end, I'll show you the end of this poem, but it's very worth looking up um, some of the other odes he wrote. Um, there, he wrote an ode to socks. He wrote an ode to um, tomatoes. He wrote an ode to salt. Um, and they're all really wonderful. And um, they, I don't read, I don't know Spanish, but they just to read them in Spanish or hear them read in Spanish, they're also really beautiful in Spanish. Um, now I am going to just look at you for a sec because I want to see the chat and see what people had to say. Oh, these are great lists. A pepper mill, a down vest, a pair of scissors, nail clipper, <laughs> empty pill bottle, uh, rainbow pencil with sparkly star on top, multi-colored scribbled on sticky notes. I have those too, Damien, that could be my thing. An elderly pumpkin, I love it. A photo of a corn stalk. Hi, Carol. A glass container of seashells, an empty spool, walnut and shell, watercolor palettes, Neutrogena sunscreen bottle. That's great. All the getting the brand name in there. Candle with cracking wick, of um, chapstick, AP style book, back scratcher, computer screen, of course, coffee cup empty, file folders not yet filed. Oh, this sounds like, this is like, a. these are all like little portraits of a writer's um, office. I love the, all the things that have glitter, glittery clothespins, um, white ceramic teapot, plate full of pasta. Somebody's eating their um, lunch, I guess. And uh, a baseball cap, a tape measure. So just see that pork postcard of a Sicilian mosaic. That sounds beautiful. Scotch tape dispenser, um, painted bright yellow, a date stamp, a tube of hand lotion. So yeah, you should. Everybody should read through these wonderful lists here. I don't know if I got everybody on now. Um, now, can you still see my screen or not? No, we can't. Okay. Okay, well, I'm rather than look at the screen, because now I've lost everything but the chat. Um, I'm going to just read you the next exercise, and then I'll bring it back up, because this is our, the first exercise is going to be, um, to pick an object. The first one is going to be an exercise in description. So I want to pick one object from your list and hold it in your hand. Or if it's too large, just touch it, but use your or put your hands on it and close your eyes and explore it with your hands. Explore it tactilely. Then listen to it, which might involve it might not make any sound. So that might involve like dropping it or wrapping it against a service just to see what kinds of sounds it might make. Um, 
smell it. Again, it might not have a smell, but see, you know, what your what your nose can tell you. And if you like, even put it in your mouth, just see if it has a taste. You don't have to, if that sounds, if it seems like it's something gross or you don't want to taste it. Um, and once you've done that, open your eyes and jot down words about what you felt, heard, smelled, and tasted. And I'll give you um, five minutes to do that. And I'll try to figure out why I can't see anybody and why you can't see my screen. And if you finish up that, you can move on to um, visual description, looking at the object and writing, making a few notes about words about its physical appearance. And um, I know there are a few um, artists here in the that work on graphic work as well. So if part of the way that you want to relate to or understand the object is draw it, as feel free to do that too. <clears throat> okay, now, um, now we're moving on to the next exercise. So we're going to do sort of cumulative exercises today. And then when I, um, when we finish, we'll be, um, when we finish, we'll do a, a, a sort of a, something that brings it all together. And then we'll get to read what we did. And it, it can either be the individual pieces that, or the cumulative piece. So the next step, and I'm just having so much trouble here with my screen share that I'm just going to read to you. I'm sorry. Um, the next step is to do a
is to talk about the object. I apologize, I'm just having some bad technical issues. This is letting the object speak. And I'm gonna read you a poem that's called The Kitchen Shears Speak. And I can put in the text um, in the chat, I think. I'll link to it. <clears throat> well, I'm not going to do that. The kitchen shears speak. I'll get the this division must end. Again, I'm forced to amputate the chicken's limb, slit the joint, clip the heart, snip wing from back, strip fat from flesh, separate everything from itself. I'm used, thrown down by unknown hands, by cowards who can't bear to do the constant severing. Open and close, open and close. I work and never tell. Though mostly made of mouth, I have no voice, no legs. My arms are bent, immobile, pinions gripped by strangers. I fear the grudge things must hold. I slice rose from bush, skin from muscle, head from carrot, root from lettuce, tail from fish. I break the bone. What if they join against me, uncouple me, throw away one half or hide my slashed eye? Or worse, what if I never die? What I fear most is being caught than rusted rigid, punished like a prehistoric bird, fossilized and changed into a winged lizard, trapped while clawing air, stuck in stone with open beak by Christiane Balk. So your next exercise is to say, if your object would, could talk, what would it tell you? Write a monologue in the voice of your object. Um, and I'm gonna give you five minutes to do that. And I will, in the meantime, also put the link to the poem in the chat. I, I put a link to the poem in the chat, Anne. Oh, thank you, Amy. Thanks for finding it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Okay, time to wrap that up. Get your last, um, the last voice, last thing that your object has to say to you. And now I'm gonna put another poem into the chat with a link. And this is about, do all of you know the um, American Girl dolls? The doll, a doll is a little bit more of a loaded object than the kinds of objects we're writing about, but this is a wonderful poem that really looks into how an object is made. Um, one Something that really haunted me that I discovered, I know now maybe about 10, 15 years ago, there was a um, news report that was, there had been a lawsuit in China about these um, little paper clips. So this is something that one never thinks about and about um, the factory conditions in the factory that made these and how the women, it was mostly women who put them together had been losing um, feeling in their fingers because of how the, the um, how these were put together or the, the manufacturing process. So that was one of the beginnings besides socks, the first cat pencil was thinking about who's touched this object before I did, who, who actually made it, where does it come from and going farther back into um, the materials themselves. So you can go way, way far back into the origin story of your object. But that's what I'd like you to think about is how did it come into your life? But before that, I'll read you this poem about, um, you know, that's based on the, is about the doll Addie. And you can read along. You need to scroll down because there's an introduction to it. It was from, if if any of you ever listened to the wonderful poetry co uh, podcast, um, The Slowdown, um, Ada Limone was the host. Uh, now it's uh, Major Jackson. And it's just five minutes every day and you get to hear a poem. And, uh, and also this very, very um, thoughtful reflection on it beforehand. So this was in the slowdown a few months ago, last year sometime. Addie by Moonheart, formerly known as Kim Mayo. Two cold hands picked me up, packed ounces of cotton up the slit in my back, popped my plastic legs in place and left me there a moment undone, armless, my new legs split open, one pointed north, one pointed south. I was nimble as my maker's hands, thumbing each eye into its rightful socket, my gaze blank as the ground above my twice great grandmother's grave. They could make us anything, I thought, as me and my sisters lay nose down on the factory table, searching for any shallow breath as our makers twisted our necks straight, flushed upon our vinyl half smiles with paint, grabbed our right arm from the line, then our left popped them in, threw us back in the bin at their shift's end. We were all just black for a moment, the stuffed animals of our chest still naked, heaving against each other in the bite of the factory night's cold, keeping each other warm as we could there before, as we could there before tomorrow, where we'd be lined up shoulder to shoulder, snooped and pricked in search of defect, branded at the nape of our necks when they found none, pleasant company, all unaware of the name they'll give us in the next room, the pink dress, the work bonnet, the work boots, the bonnet, the gourd. So what I would like you to do is um, to write, think about, you can just answer these questions. I don't know if you have to write a whole narrative, but the questions are, where did your object come from? Where was it made? Who made it? Who else has touched it? Is it unique? What materials is it made of? Where did they come? Where did they come from? And anything else you can think of about um, its origin story. I'll put those questions in the chat as well. Yeah. And you could have five minutes to answer those questions and um, shape that into a narrative. 
if you want to. You don't need to shape it into a narrative. Okay, you have one more minute. Okay, wrap, wrap that up, but we have one last thing for writing, and then um, we'll do some sharing. Here, I just, I have, since I, I've, since my slides aren't working, here's, here's my Addy picture for you. I could have had it there before, but there she is, uh, to, if you don't know what she looks like. So um, now, back to Neruda. This is the end of the same ode that we started at the beginning, and um, your last assignment is going to be to take everything that you've learned about your object and to write an ode to it. Um, and it could be a, 
it can be an ode in prose. It doesn't have to be in, in poetry form, but something that celebrates your object based on the kinds of things you learn. But first, will somebody read for me the last lines that I put in the chat of the poem? Do I have any volunteers? Can I see you guys? Uh, Laura, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Many things conspired to tell me the whole story. Not only did they touch me or my hand touch them, they were so close that they were a part of my being. They were so alive with me that they lived half my life and will die half my death. So if you could remember all the things he was talking about at the beginning, um, the thimbles and um, this, I think there were scissors and, and these are the things that he still celebrates at the end of the poem and is thinking about how alive they are, how they've become a part of him. So your assignment now is to write that. And I do have a few questions that can go with that. Um, what do you love, appreciate most about your object? What are its most salient characteristics? What did you discover about your object today? And in this, whatever, what you're writing, say something about its past, present, and future. I put those in there too. So um, we'll also do that for five minutes and then we'll come together so we can have some time to share what we've written. Two more minutes.
Okay, time to wrap up. So um, how, how was that? Did you learn things about your object? I'm curious what everyone wrote about. Um, so now we have some time to share our work for those who are willing to share. And you can either put things in the chat or um, you can read them out loud. I think it's it's wonderful for if you we should have time for about um, well several of you to be able to read out loud. Um, and if you you can read your ode if that really is a compilation of everything you did before. But if does anybody just want to write their descriptions or talk about the process of describing first? We can start with that. Holly, did you was that you wave, raising your hand? Yeah, I can talk about mine. Um, I did playing cards um, yes. and I did not know that they came from China, which was the only they were invented in China, which was the only place that had paper production um, to the degree needed for that. Um, and it was about a thousand, the year a thousand. And the, the four suits come from the four pillars of um, medieval um, society. Hearts represent the church, the spades, the military, diamonds are from the merchant class, and clubs are for farmers. And for farmers? Each, oh, so yeah. Yeah. You spade, yeah, I guess. Um, each king um, also represents some an actual historical king. The king of hearts is Charlemagne. The king of spades is King David. The king of diamonds is Caesar. And the king of clubs is Alexander the Great. Wow. Um, and um, I noted that the Rockefellers never played cards um, because Centurion played game of chance at the foot of the cross. And they will not indulge in any game of chance. Um, and uh, I just, I noted that every hierarchy has its, attracts a joker who flouts the rules. You know, the joker is kind of the outsider and it's a completely rigid hierarchy. Mm -hmm. But the joker is, is wild. And I like that idea. I thought, maybe I would make that the center of it, the joke card. Yeah, I think there have been some good, um, I mean, playing cards are, are very rich and um, in terms of their associations. And I think they're bit, well, Alice in Wonderland comes to mind, uh, but there are also um, some other writers who have, who have played with the idea of cards, not just as like telling, like as fortune telling, but also like, who are these cards as characters? Mm -hmm. um, how do they interact with each other? How do they relate in a game there? I mean, they're very rich as a subject for. Yeah, um, our, our beloved Calvino for one. Yes, our beloved Calvino does love cards and games a chance and think, yes. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, anybody else want to talk about things they discovered or their descriptions or read something you wrote? Um, Jane. This is a complaint from my tape measure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she hardly ever uses me. I sit in a sewing kit for years, surrounded by unopened packages of needles, a pin cushion shaped like a tomato, bright embroidery thread, thread that is so eager to create a sampler or turn into dragons and flowers on a denim jacket. There are knitting needles waiting for socks and a small jar of stray buttons, but we just sit here. So I love it. Thank you. <laughs> they, I like the idea of, um, the um the what that waiting i mean that there are certain things that don't get if they're not used they're just sitting there not get sort of feeling like they're not quite fulfilling their potential and i really like the way you captured that and i also mm -hmm. like the way that it was a single object it's a single object but then you have it in its context of the other objects so you called in to place the other things that it's around and i could see it being you could do something where the other objects take their turns speaking and maybe some are less 
impatient or more lazy or more, you know, that it would be fun to play with just what's in the sewing basket. And uh, yeah, voices from the sewing basket. Voices yes. from the sewing basket and who gets used as beautiful. And the color, I like the color in there too. Um, anybody else have um, an ode? Does anyone have an ode that they wrote to their object? I don't know if I'm seeing everybody because I feel like I keep um so you can is Susan, did you just raise your hand? I did, and so did Laura. You okay, well Susan. Laura? No. <laughs> Susan and Laura. Okay. okay. All right. This is called Fall Towel. <clears throat> soft and nubby on one side, soft and flat on the other. The ridges there on the flat side are easier to see than feel. The images there on the flat side are part botany lesson, part trite version of autumn. <laughs> Oak leaf, maple leaf, bittersweet branch, each floating on white ground. Microfiber, leaves no lint, available for 125 at your nearest Dollar Tree. <laughs> Who helped operate the industrial looms that created the sheet of pseudo Terry that became this practical, decorative, super soft accessory. What machine stamped the design on one side, surged the edges and corners? Was it hard and dark, an atmosphere rich in harsh chemicals, where this soft throwaway, tacky but not shedding piece of fluff was created? Mm. Lovely. That's lovely. I like I really like the way you repeated flat, lies flat at the um, beginning, that the, there was something about that repetition that gave us a good sense. And I, the texture was so vivid. And then going into the back the backstory of how it was made. Um so. which was totally made up. So yeah, you somebody to knows anything it. about the industry. Right, right. Yeah, but know. that's it's the question. I mean, it's mm -hmm. asking the question of where it came from. Um, Laura. Well, I have some thoughts. They're not an ode yet, but I do have to show my yellow tape dispenser, um, which is very <laughs> heavy. I think it's, well, it's stainless steel or cast iron or something. It's filled with sand and it is just pretty insistently not ephemeral because of its weight and its bright yellowness. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have it because my partner rescued it from a company that was going out of business. And that company was called Jetronic, which is a very future, Jetronic Industries, which is like this very futuristic name, but which is kind of at odds with tape because tape so ordinary. <laughs> um, and he probably rescued it 20 plus years ago. And 20 years ago, tape seemed way more useful than it seems now. Like it just strikes mm -hmm. me that there's so much less paper. I can't remember the last time I taped something, but this yeah. um, tape dispenser, which he, it was like a industrial gray and Matthew spray painted it bright yellow. And it's like cheery. I, I feel like it's sort of saying, here I am, I'm, I'm ready whenever something needs to be taped. But just as Jetronic Industries seemed really kind of um, retro uh, 20 years ago, maybe 20 years from now, the idea of tape is going to be retro because there won't be anything physical to tape. Yeah, that's a, I know that's the, that's a good, um, that's a good point is I didn't even ask. I'm very interested in obsolete, obsolete technology or obsolescing technology and how we look at it. And um the idea that we we start noticing things about um, or get nostalgic for things that used to be so ordinary that they wouldn't have inspired nostalgia because you just use them every day and they're just kind of workaday things. But then it's like, oh, tape, remember tape. And then that's when you really start noticing things like the tactile qualities. I wasn't, didn't it feel great to put a ta tape on a piece of paper. And uh, so that it's a rich thing and it's a beautiful, there's something so wonderful about that yellow. And that um, yeah. is, um, I think you could just go to town writing about that shade of yellow and the, it's a very, it's very spring colored. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, that is sort of like the spring color, but there it is sitting like this sculpture, modern sculpture on your uh, on your desk. Yeah, and it's a, it's very school busy also. And you know, I used to love tape. Tape was for fixing things. Tape was for wrapping gifts. You know, nowadays mm -hmm. not everybody wants to use wrapping paper because it's wasteful. You know, there's so many. There's a yeah. lot there. That's when I use it. Um, somebody said, remember the scissor scene in two weeks notice. I do not, but somebody, and Amy, um, Holly, and Amy was talking about how on PCs, they call cut and paste what um, used to be actual cut and paste. And some of us are of the age where we did mm -hmm. use to cut and paste things. And I still, I sometimes cut things out by hand and, and tape them together. Um, I find it very satisfying. Uh, so any um, anybody else have an ode? A oh go, go ahead, Olivia. So I'm not gonna share my ode because it's still like a work in progress, but I really took a journey with my sunscreen bottle. <laughs> <laughs> because when we were talking about the third thing, like who made it, I became I thought that I was a like my first my my monologue as the object was really like had a lot of attitude. So like the sunscreen bottle is probably pretty upset that like we all buy these and then we throw them in the bottom of our bag and then we forget about them because we have these <laughs> grand delusions of like putting sunscreen on every day and we never do until we go to the beach and then we forget where we had our sunscreen and we buy another one and then we have like all these but um <laughs> as we were thinking about like who made this I got really attached to the idea of this being made of plastic mm. um which I and plastic coming from crude oil which comes mm -hmm. from like the remains of dinosaurs um, who were wiped out because like the asteroid hit the earth and covered <laughs> the sun, like literally blocked the sun. And now we put the sun block in kind of this like last oh, wow. piece of prehistory. Mm -hmm. um, but also thinking about how this is, like if we think about it that way, it is a prehistoric sort of piece, but also plastic doesn't break down. Like it's never going to return to that state. It's always mm -hmm. going to stay here in its final form. So I jotted down a lot of like half-baked thoughts about that, but overall, again, I really, <laughs> me and this sunscreen bottle have taken a journey together. I never expected to end up here. Wow, that's great. I love the idea of um, the sunblock and blocking the sun and taking it all the way back to the dinosaurs. Um, that's just magnificent. And then, you know, seeing yourself. And even when you said half-baked, I had to laugh because I was thinking about baking on the beach and all that was um, there, Rich. Um, yeah, go with it. I hope you do something with it. Um, I liked that, you know, these brand names came up. I forget what the, was that, what the brand name is, but you- This is Neutrogena. Neutrogena. You can buy it at Target. Yeah. yeah, so that could be played with too, but- um, Oh, I hope you um I hope you go further on this journey with the sunscreen. It sounds it's really rich and wonderful. And uh, yes, who knows? When you think about where things come from and go down back and back and back and back, it sort of like could lead to um all sorts of surprises. Anybody else? Carol? I'll share. I'll share. I did um letting the, I'll share my letting my object speak. And it's a old wooden spool oh, wow. that I chose. Um, and so here's what I wrote. So humble and heavy, wooden and round. I held things tightly, fiber that would be transform, it transformed into beauty or maybe transformed into a well-loved object with little beauty. Who knows? The future was infinite and I could not see it. I am stable and round, balanced, and made from the heart of a tree. Empty, I await my next calling. Mm. So, oh, I love it. That's beautiful. And there's no markings on this. I like I don't, it was given to me, and I have no idea of what the history, what it held before. Um, you know, so I don't know what, what it'll be used for afterwards, but <laughs> you so it's you have it as a kind of decorative object. Well, I do a lot of fiber arts. So someone gave me a bunch of um, these large wooden spools to, you know, to use in my art, but they, they're just sitting in my studio. So I haven't done anything with them for years. They're, they're gathering dust. <laughs> they're good dust collectors. 
a dust collector. I one of the I really like, and you know, I've had that question about what the what's the future of the object, but I like that the object itself doesn't know the future of what it does. Like after you know that it it held these materials or this yeah. this um, yarn or something, and it it didn't have any idea of what became of that yarn. I mean, I feel like that was, that's a really good direction to go in if you wanted to do more of that, um, that idea that something there's, that you can only see so far into the future and it kind of is what it is. And once it's, you know, it, it, it's being used in a certain way, but it can't see beyond a certain place. I, I like that you brought that out and, um, and that it speculates and then says, who knows? <laughs> yeah. It could be beautiful. It could be something else. That's sort of like, yeah. I mean, isn't that true of all of us? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen? Yeah. Like that so, sewing box. What? <laughs> yeah, to it's go like with the, the sewing, sewing box. box. All the things that were in the sewing box. Okay. I I love the the voices the voices that have come out because there's a lot of um. In all of the ones that spoke about the voices of their objects, there's a certain amount of frustration of not, you know, the, I love the, you know, the uh, sunscreen um, gets left in the bag and you buy a new one. I mean, this kind of um, impatience with the people who own it and saying, you know, well, you got me, but why are you using me? So I, that was um, an interesting way to look at objects. The poem about the kitchen shears was kind of the opposite. It was almost like, oh, you asked me to do so much and I'm kind of overworked here and you don't even know how how hard and how gruesome this job is, which is another another take on looking at the things we make our objects do. Um, but there's certainly plenty of objects that are that sit kind of fallow, just waiting to um, having that we need to activate them. So if anybody else wants, we have time for one more. But if, if nobody has one, what I'll do is um, can close with reading, if I can find it. Oh, and thank you for being patient with my technical problems. I apologize for those. And um, hopefully I'm not going to give you one last one. Yeah, I. so I'm going to read you the whole um, Neruda poem, if, if that's okay with everyone. See if you don't have the, um, if nobody else has anything else to read, um, because it's pretty wonderful. Ode to Things. I have a crazy, crazy love of things. I like pliers and scissors. I love cups, rings, and bowls, not to speak, or co of course, of hats. I love all things, not just the grandest, also the infinite, infinitely small, thimbles, spurs, plates, and flower vases. Oh yes, the planet is sublime. It's full of pipes weaving handheld through tobacco smoke and keys and salt shakers. Everything, I mean, that is made by the hand of man, every little thing, shapely shoes and fabric, and each new bloodless birth of gold, eyeglasses, carpenter's nails, brushes, clocks, compasses, coins, and the so soft softness of chairs. Mankind has built oh so many perfect things, built them of wool and of wood, of glass and of rope, remarkable tables, ships and stairways. I love all things, not because they are passionate or sweet smelling, but because I don't know, because this ocean is yours and mine. These buttons and wheels and little forgotten treasures, fans upon whose feathers love has scattered in blossoms, glasses, knives, and scissors all bear the trace of someone's fingers on their handle or surface, the trace of a distant hand lost in the depths of forgetfulness. I pause in houses, streets, and elevators touching things, identifying objects that I secretly covet. This one because it rings, that one because it's as soft as the softness of a woman's hip, that one there for its deep sea color and that one for its velvet feel. Oh, irrevocable, irrevocable river of things. No one can say that I loved only fish or the plants of the jungle in the field, 
that I loved only those things that leap and climb, desire and survive. It's not true. Many things conspired to tell me the whole story. Not only did they touch me or my hand touched them, they were so close that they were part of my being. They were so alive with me that they lived half my life and will die half my death. So on that note, <laughs> And I, it's really worth reading the rest of the um, Neruda poems. And um, yeah, I love somebody said, I love how he connects small things to big ideas, love of each other, of the ocean. And it really is when you think about the river of things, um, we kind of look today on the, oh, the title is, oh, it's just called Ode to Things, but the collection is called Ode to Common Things. And you can find other odes. He, the, all the odes are wonderful. I almost had you had read um, Ode to Socks, Ode to My Socks, I think it's called, which is very fun. But we didn't end, we didn't end up doing items of clothing. So I wanted to do things that were a little less personal and kind of look at the objects in a way that they were a little less personal. Um, remarkable tables, yeah. It's so. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope this thank was you. fun. It was fun for me, and it was fun to hear about all your objects. And um, I think it's good. It's a great um, writing prompt. Like if you get stuck with something, it's just kind of fun to like, just pick up an object and, and explore some of these, um, it, it go through some of these exercises as just a way to get yourself started. Um, a friend of mine once did a workshop and I, you can't do this, you have to do this with someone else, but it's fun to put some things in a paper bag and pull it out with your eyes closed and just feel it um, without, knowing what it is and try to figure out what it is first. Um, so enjoy um, and happy writing. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thank you all for Thank joining. You. Thank you. Thank you.